place where you all can come and we can share and uh, talk about different topics every month. Yeah, that button actually is from, it's the, we bought them from a young woman at ISNA last year, and she is a from Singapore. So I think these originate in Singapore. Aren't they super cute? I love them so much. Make it up and have faith. Look how cute. So cute. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salatu al Oh, that was you, Sriani? Mashallah. Oh, my God. How exciting. That's really cool. And here we are together. Look. Look at this. I love this. Let's follow his sunnah. Look at that cute face. <laughs> I love these. Subhanallah, ala sala. I didn't make that connection. I'm so happy. Mashallah. All right. Ahlan wa sahlan. Assalamu alaykum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salatu al-Salam ala khatun anbiya Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sahabihi wa sahabihi This week we are talking about new hijrah new you because we are in Muharram. And it is the month of the Hijrah, the month where the Hijrah began, and so the month of change, the month of the new year. We're 1441 this year, right? 1441. And um, that is a brand new year for us. We're in the 15th century, <laughs> which when we compare it to Western civilization, we might say, wow, we're doing really well. Uh, when we think about how far we are from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have to say, I would which we were closer in our lives, in our actions, in our feelings, in our, in our just lifestyle and way. But inshallah, we will become, as we are the people who will work to be the Sahaba of this time, inshallah. All right, so I want to talk about new hijra, new you. I want to talk about what are the kinds of hijra, what are hijras that people have made before? What kind of hijra can we plan to make this year? And so as you think about this, I want you to walk with me. I want you to think about yourself. And sometimes people make change because something happens. Sometimes people make change because they get tired of the place that they are. Sometimes people make change because they have a sudden realization. So for me, I'm, uh, I'm working on sort of a physical hijra, I suppose, because a year ago I had a bad blood test. You know, I'm in my 50s now, so these things happen. And so I was like, all right, I got to change my lifestyle. I'm not doing a perfect job, but I've, I've, I've had some accomplishments along that way. And so that, for me, that was a life change. And so that is a hijrah in its own way. Uh, there is no longer the hijrah of Mecca to Medina, let's say, to go to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But we always can go from one place to another to be closer to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in our life and in our action in, and how we are and, and uh, how we live. So the, for me, it was a blood test. I'm sure things have happened to you before we were like, Oh, my father, for example, he told me that he went on sort of a physical hijra, meaning he changed his diet, he changed his lifestyle, because he saw himself on television, and, oh no, he was, he was presenting in court, and a woman was describing him and said, that heavy gentleman over there, and he was like, whoa, I've never been described like that. So he immediately started to make some changes, which alhamdulillah he did, because he also was dealing with some diabetic issues and things like that. So um, that's a reason people make life changes. In this world today, people make those, people go on diets, but it's not a hijra. Uh, sometimes those kind of diets that you go on where it's not really like, it's like, oh, I want to fit into this outfit or I want to be cuter or I want to whatever. That's not a lifestyle change. That's not a hijra. That's not what a hijra is. So if we can sort of do a comparison, what is hijra and what isn't, a diet isn't hijra. A lifestyle change is, is hijra. And I think we all know the difference between that, right? When we say we're going to go on a diet, we eat like crazy on Saturday and Sunday. We set our diet on Monday, and by Tuesday, we're back to whatever we were eating before. Start again the next week. Hishra is making habit changes, making lifestyle changes, going from one way of being to another way of being. And it's not easy. It's not easy. Not physically and not uh, spiritually or emotionally or uh, in any other way. So the hijrah, of course, that we want to talk about here today is the spiritual hijrah, the moving from one place to another spiritually. And, what, you know, you all know, or some of you know, I suppose, that I've been traveling, and one of the places I was in was Konya. And mashallah, Konya is such a beautiful, um, beautiful city. And it's not, not only beautiful in its beauty, it's beautiful in its, in its hal and the feeling of it. There's a, it's just so... I don't know, there's a, there's a thick sense of peace there. 
But one of the, uh, so when we're there, not but one of these, sorry, one of the, the story, one of the places, yes, one of the places you can stop is the place where Rumi met Shams. Those of you who don't know this story, I won't tell the whole thing now, but I just want to say that the reason Jalal al-Din al-Rumi became who he was was because of that meeting. Originally, Jalal al-Din al-Rumi was a scholar. He came from a line of scholars. His father was a great scholar. And he, they moved, subhanAllah, they moved from where he was born, which was the Bakh or Balkh, I think, to Konya because for personal reasons, his father's personal reasons. But after they moved, there was a terrible, the, the Mughal came to where they originally were. And so it's like almost like Allah SWT was protecting this young child from the war where so many scholars were killed uh, in the original town he was from. Anyway, so he followed in his father's footsteps. He became a great scholar. I mean, a great scholar. He had students. He was an alim, an alim, okay, a knower, a, 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 a a learned man, a learned man, someone who we might say today, someone like a PhD, okay? And he had students who followed him and listened to him. He was a jurist. Anyway, he was walking. No, he wasn't walking. He was riding his mount. And as he was riding this animal, horse, donkey, depends on the picture you see. Allahu alim. Not real photograph, of course, painting. Uh, he met a man who was an ascetic, who was a person who was a little bit strange in the eyes of people. He had a funny hat. And when I say he had a funny hat, I mean, the, the Muslim world, the men of the Muslim world wore hats. But those hats designated something. They designated a scholar. They designated a, an arif billah. They designated different things, scholars of different even areas or places over that. So his hat was funny, and it wasn't typical of any of the hats. Oh, my sound is going in and out. I shall stop moving around and tell my admins to tell me if I'm doing okay here. Okay. Um, the, so his hat was funny, and that, that's significant because it, this, it made his students not respect him. Because, again, he didn't have the hat of a scholar, not his students. It made Rumi's students not respect this man, and so they were just shocked when this sort of travel-weary, worn-out-looking person with a funny hat came up to Maulana Jalal al-Din al-Rumi. He stopped the animal. He pulled on the bridle of the animal. And he said, who is better? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or a famous, uh, famous uh, spiritual man of the time? And Rumi said, what, what, of what question is this? Of course, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is better. And he answered, then why is it that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked for forgiveness every day and said, Rabbana zidni ilman, Allahumma zidni ilman, Ya Allah, grant me more knowledge. But this other person said, Alhamdulillah, I am, sat I am satiated with the knowledge of God. And Rumi, this for Rumi, was the beginning of his hijrah. Because he realized at that moment, this question, it, 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 uh, it threw him, because he realized at that moment the incredible, true greatness of the Prophet not just what he had been teaching, but the true greatness of the Prophet, one who is never, one who is one who is an ocean, never overflows with water. And the limitations of all others who he had considered great, who can be filled because they are lakes, they are bowls, they are pots, they are bathtubs, they are whatever. The Prophet is an ocean who can never be filled in his, in his level with God. So for Rumi, this was a moment for him. And Shams of Tabriz became his teacher. I'm not here to tell the story of Rumi and Shams or any of that, but I, this is the moment of Rumi's hijra. He went from being a local scholar to a person who, if you visit his grave today in Konya, 
you will see people from all walks of life, and I mean all walks of life, including different religions, coming to visit him, coming to pay their respects, coming to pay their respects to the man who reminded them of love, of the love of God, that God is real. And that is, that is something that we don't see in anyone else. Like, it's just amazing to think that he reaches from the, his century to today to remind people, la ilaha illallah. Now, the, the hijra that Rumi went on was a deep spiritual hijra with his teacher, Shams. That is a type of hijra as well, a deep spiritual hijra. He didn't plan for it. He didn't say, I need to make this hijra. It happened to him. And so it was something that happened because of a, of a moment. And sometimes that can happen. Is, I mean, I'm sure, you know, we, we've, um, we've met people or something has happened to us where we've said, whoa, I have to do work on myself. We have a card here in our store. Just was looking at it earlier, and I think it's very beautiful. Let me pull it out so you can see it. It has a beautiful quote. It says, I thought I was being so obvious. I had this version of myself that seemed so clear to me. But I don't think anyone really saw me until you. And so this can be taken in many different ways, of course. But when we true, this is a, a quote that sometimes that I, I guess I shared it just because I'm thinking about Rumi and Shams, where all of his, all of Rumi's students saw him, you know, as this great scholar, which he was, but Shams saw him as a person who needed growth, which he also was, subhanAllah. So the, the process of change can happen because we meet someone. In today's world, it could be someone online. It could be some, a post, a Twitter, a tweet, an, an Instagram post, something that tells us, wait, I need to pause, I need to think, and I need to move forward. Now, the thing about hijrah is that it's a true moving forward, and it's, there's, it's not an easy path. So the struggle today, when we talk about new hijra, new you, the struggle today is that if we want to, if we want to do hijra, we have to really look at the Prophet Sallallahu and look at the hijra of his companions and understand that the walking of hijra is a movement. It takes effort. It takes deep thought. It's not just a witted. It's not like somebody... I have people, I've, I've heard people say, for example, or they've asked me, give me a witted answer. Give me a, something to say every day that's going to change my life. Having a witted every day can change your life, but it's not going to be by itself. It's going to change your life so that you then have to work on the different qualities within you. So a truly new Hijra, new you is recognizing where we are. We look at the Prophet ﷺ and we look at his companions. They were in Mecca. In Mecca, they were in a place where they were abused, they were oppressed. They were not able to practice their religion fully. That's the point here. Then they moved to Medina. The process of movement was difficult for many of them. And it was a process. And then in Medina, they also had to grow. It wasn't, they weren't done there. But now they were in a place, a physical geographical place, where they could practice their religion. So for us, we need to say, what is it of our faith that we are not practicing well? What is it that we're not doing? What of the sunnah of the Prophet What is that cute little button I just showed you? Let me see. Where is it? It's so fun. Yeah. I love the Prophet right? So let's follow his sunnah. What is it of his sunnah that we don't follow? Is it in the details? Is it in the big picture? Is it in how we treat people? Is it in our patience? Is it in the way we approach life? What is it? So that then we have to move. If we're going to do a hijrah in 1441, we have to go from where we are to where we can be, where we can practice this religion better. We live in a secular world, a world that tells us that everything is important except for our faith. Our money is important. Our looks are important. Our sexual appeal is important. Our um, grades are important. 
What we own is important. Where we live is important. All these things that people tell us are important. How we feel about ourselves is important. But we have to we have to recognize that we're being influenced by those thoughts. And so there, how much of our time are they taking up? How much of our time is taken up with with spending money, retail therapy, going online and shopping, shopping at uh, downtown at the mall or downtown wherever? How much time is taken up in shopping, in looking at things and looking online, discovering things you didn't know we didn't know we needed? And how much time, on the other hand, is taken up in taking care of ourselves spiritually, in reading new books about Islam, in taking classes about a ribat class, for example. We, alhamdulillah, I was just in a teacher's meeting before I came on here, and I'm so proud of our program. I mean, I'm so proud of it. We have all these tracks. We have a track in the purification of the self. If you could start in the beginning of that level one and go all the way through, and become a specialist in that. We have fuqa, we have sirah, we have social sciences, we have Arabic, we have Quran. I and mean, I am I'm proud of this in the way that that we are that that we're proud of. I'm proud and I'm pleased and I'm hoping that it will change the very fabric of our Muslim society as a, with a rising tide of Muslim women who are religious leaders and Islamic teachers and women who can connect to the ilm of their faith and the practice of their faith. Like when we when we say I don't have time to take a class, or I don't have time to memorize Quran, I don't have time to learn Arabic, I don't have time, I don't have time, I don't have time. Why don't we have time? What are we doing instead? So the history is moving from that place of I can't do this faith to the place where I can. Mecca, Medina. I'm not talking about geography. I'm talking about how we are living our lives. And so as Muslim women. In this year, in this time, in this fall, it's such a beautiful time to be thinking about Hijra. We need to look at our, we need to look at three parts of our lives, all right? We need to look at our practice, our, our practice of, um, our, our basic practice, our prayer. Are you praying Fajr on time? There is no reason ever to skip a fuddled prayer. Ever. Ever. Not not because we want to leave, I mean, when our children are asleep and we don't want to wake them up, no, wake them up. They should see you getting up and praying. It should be more valuable to us to be praying than to worry about them waking up or not. The, we're not praying we're, because we're in the car and the time, it's winter now, the hood is going to get shorter and shorter. Leave the house with wudu. Keep a bottle of water in your car to make wudu if you have to. If you have to stop anywhere and pray, we got to stop and pray. This should be the year that we don't miss photo prayer anymore. We have to stop expecting to find peace in our hearts if we are missing prayer. It just doesn't make any sense. I mean, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us through Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam five prayers a day, five. That's what, we have five prayers a day. Like, let's not talk about this in a romantic way. Let's talk about this in a very serious way. You want to live? You got to eat. You want to live? You got to drink. You got to breathe air. That's what we have to do. Like, we know this about ourselves. We can go for a while without eating. Everyone's doing intermittent fasting now. And we all have extra fat that we can live off of, right? So you have to eat. You have to drink water. The prayer is how you keep your spirit alive. Unlike this life, we want a nice, fat, chubby spirit. We want one that is fattened by lots of prayer, sunnah and fardu, hajjud, dhikr, dua. We want it. We want it fattened, so that and, it, and so that during a time in our life where, let's say, we have a lot of extra work, we can't do extra sunnah. Let's say you have a new baby, and you're running, chasing after this kid, and you can't do twelve rakats of duha. You can't do the extra things that you were doing before. So this big, fat, gorgeously fat and chunky, chubby spirit. Thins down, but it doesn't die of starvation. Today, we have an epidemic of people missing prayers who then expect to be fine and haven't felt the feeling. They don't understand that the reason they're not, they don't have feelings is because they're missing prayers. There's been a death. There's been a death in the heart, a death in the self. 
Prayers should not be missed. This is the year of the Hijrah of not missing prayers. And I'll tell you, if you are missing Fajr, then start trying to pray to Hajjur. Because praying to Hajjur will help you stop missing Fajr. Because if you're if you're getting up for Hajjur, then you're going to pray Fajr for sure. And just as a footnote for those of you who would like some help with that, we have Tajr threads available. Maybe one of our admins could put a uh, the link in the thread. We don't want to miss a photo prayer, not even once in a year. I want us. I want to really emphasize this. I'm not talking about stop missing it every day. I'm so, trying to stop missing it and know that if you miss a prayer, something's going on between you and Allah. We need to have taqwa of missing prayers. We need to have taqwa where we say, Ya Allah, why, why did I miss this khair in my life? Why is it that my voice was not accepted to be of the voices that are reading their prayers at that time of day? We need to take it seriously. And if there's any hijra that we do this year, if there's no other hijra that we do this year, at least we should do the hijra of no more missed prayers. We need to become Muslim in that way. The prayer is a pillar of our deen. A pillar, rikin, deen, rikin. It's a pillar of our deen. We have to be serious about not missing them. Wherever we are, and you know, we're always asking Allah for things, like we're asking for tawfiq. We're asking for so much. We need to ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having fulfilled our debt to Allah. Our debt to Allah is our prayer. Or our expectation, if you will, if I can use a different word. If you're a teacher in a classroom and you ask your, you ask your uh, students to do their homework and to do tests and they do nothing, what grade are you going to give them? If you're married and you ask your husband, please pay the electric bill. And please, and he's late with that darn electric bill every single month. And he forgets to pay your phone bill and your phone turns off every single month. And he forgets to pay the television, the internet bill every single month. He doesn't pay that bill. Not because he doesn't have the money. Not because he's struggling. Because he forgets or because he's stingy. How do you feel? How are you feeling? Are you feeling like, yeah, you know what? I want to get up and make you dinner. I'm going to fold those socks. You're like, what is going on? Pay the darn bill. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're so free. We're like, mm, I don't pray. It's okay. Allah ghafoorur rahim. Yes, Allah ghafoorur rahim. It's true. Allah is the forgiving and the merciful. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-adil, is the just one. And is the one who, who calls us to account who calls us to account. And so be aware of that as you walk on this path of so boldly missing prayers. Even again, with your, that husband of yours who doesn't pay any bills, God forbid, I hope that's not anyone for real. If he comes and he's like, oh, I didn't pay it, big deal. What are you upset about? You're, you are my wife. You are supposed to be loving. You are supposed to be kind. And if I don't pay the bill, I feel like paying the bill. I don't want to spend the money on it. I want to buy my uh, self uh, fun toys, cars, and I don't want to pay the bills. You're going to literally go crazy. You may just go home to mother. You may be like, that is, I'm done with you, buddy. Both Allah, we're bold and brazen. And we are, Ya Ghafoor, Ya Rahim. I missed the prayer. I said, mashallah, mashallah, you know, I can actually pray it. It was hard. It was this, it was this. What? I mean, it was hard. I was tired. Allah, you're too tired to, to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No. 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 This is not our way. It's not the way of the believer. It's not the way of the Muslim. We have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to do this. This is an order. This is part of our belief. Part of our deen. Part of what keeps us alive spiritually. And we need to make hijra today from that place where we can't do it for whatever reason. Are you embarrassed? Are we embarrassed in front of people? We don't want to get up and pray in front of people. We don't want to tell people just a minute, I got to pray. We need to make hijra from having shame of what's good. Ya Allah, Muslims today, I feel, I, I'm, I, my heart 
is hurting for us today, our young people and, and our older people, when we are in places and we feel shame to do good, we feel shame to dress in hijab, we feel shame to get up and pray, we feel shame because the people around us look at us with the eye of, are you really that religious? Come on, don't you want to be like me? Don't you want to be like us? Don't you want to put, no, I don't want to be like you. But here's the other thing. That, that sort of, there are plenty of people out there who have no shame in stealing, in uh, nakedness, in, in being exactly bold in their life choices, exactly, in doing all sorts of things that are even child abuse sometimes, bold in these things. But we're ashamed. We're ashamed to say, excuse me, I have to pray. I just can't pray right in front of them. And, you know, hey, I'm, what's your problem with my prayer? Old person sitting next to his girlfriend, smushing her face. Dude, what in the world? I'm praying. Alhamdulillah. Alhamd I'm, I want to be proud of that prayer. What a blessing that Allah gave me the prayer. I want to move from the Mecca of shame, the, the feeling of I can't do this in front of you, to the Medina of beautiful pride. Pride in prayer. Allahu Akbar. Pride in Muslim clothing, modest clothing, without a need to show people the size of my hips, without a need to show people that, and not this, this, this feeling amongst women that I can't go out without makeup. No, I want to move from that place to the place where I can go out without makeup, where I, I want people to see the real, I want people to see me. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not shy. I don't have shame. I'm bringing you, oh world, I'm bringing you my hair. My goodness, my community activism, my ibadah, the light that is coming from my heart because of the work that I'm doing in working on myself to be a better person. That's what I'm bringing you. I'm not bringing you someone to be sexually attracted to. We need to grow up. Hey, this is the, this is the Muslim person. This is the Muslim woman. It's a beautiful thing to be. It's a beautiful thing to be to be a Muslim woman. We are people of joy intelligence, activism. We have a history of women in our, in our, throughout the centuries. One of our lovely volunteers at Rabata is in Egypt studying Arabic this semester. And yesterday she visited Siti Nafisa, who was the teacher of Imam Shafi. Ya Allah, this is, this is our history. Women of ilam, women of activism, women who built schools and institutions who had things on their mind other than, do you think I'm pretty? Really? <laughs> yeah. Thousands of dollars are in, uh, we people spend on, on makeup and all this stuff. God save. Yeah, I mean, we need to move to the place where we have something else on our mind. Not do you think I'm pretty, but ya Allah, ya Allah. Do you think I'm pretty? How does my heart look to you, ya Allah? How does my heart look, Ya Allah, to you? Is it full of bitterness? Is it full of anger? Is it full of pain? Is it full of distance? Is it even there? Is it full of diseases? Is it full of fear? Do good deeds for Allah. Make mistakes in that as much as you want. Doing, doing your best. Trying, 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 trying. But let's move away. Let's make hijra from being ashamed of doing good deeds for Allah. Ya Allah. Wherever we are, let's not be ashamed anymore. Let's instead be proud. Be proud of the choice. The choice of la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. We need to be proud of this. Proud of it and happy. I want us to be happy, joyful, happy with our in our homes, happy in our jobs, happy in our studies, happy in our the food that we eat. In our travels, whatever we do, you know, alhamdulillah, Allah, we're blessed, we're so blessed, happy in our sisterhood. We're so blessed. We want to make hijra from not seeing our blessings to seeing our blessings. We want to be the new you, we want to be the new person, the new person that we're growing and developing through all this work. When the companions went to Medina, uh, they, they were, they left behind everything, the muhajirin, they left behind everything. And so they had to be new. They had to either be new by finding new ways to live, new houses. Imagine that. You go, you don't have anything anymore. I just got back from two months of being away. 
and I'm in the <laughs> I'm making coffee in the morning, and I'm like, Mashallah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah for my own coffee pot, Alhamdulillah for my coffee grinder, Alhamdulillah, and I have some mugs that I like, like different ones, and I'm like, oh, today I'm going to use this one, today I'm going to use that one. I'm so excited about these dunya things that I have, Alhamdulillah. Imagine having to leave them all behind. And I, I, I remember when I came to the United States after 20 years in Syria, I'm, I, I, was, <clears throat> I went through a period of time where I was ashamed to tell people, and I'm not ashamed anymore because I see it's normalcy, but I was missing my couch, like very dunya things, you know? I was missing my chair. I was missing my bed. I was missing my, my teapot, missing my... Um, my plates, my forks, my kitchen utensils, the things that I had been using for 20 years in my home. So there's a, there's a, um, a, 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 a nostalgia. It's a difficulty to leave behind a, a home to go somewhere else. And sometimes when you leave behind bad habits, you miss them. And we know this with addiction, right? If people, if someone quits smoking, they miss it. I mean, this is an open halaka, halaka, but before I became Muslim, I was a smoker. And till today, and I, I quit, I put on hijab and I quit smoking. I, I mean, it just me didn't go together. Alhamdulillah, Allah made it easy for me. But until today, there are moments, moments, where I'll smell the smell of a cigarette or something, and I'll, there will be a, something in me that turns on that is attracted to it for just a moment. That's, I mean, so of, so when you make a decision to become a better person, there will be things that we miss. Maybe you will miss people being, finding you, telling you how beautiful you are or whatever. You will miss sleeping all morning. <laughs> I mean, miss uh, all sorts of different things. It's, yeah, but missing it, that's part of the reward. That's part of the reward. That, that, and so in making that hijrah and moving to this better way of living, yeah, are, you gonna, are we going to miss, I suppose, putting makeup every morning, having people tell you, oh, mashallah. Like, I don't know what's up with the Muslim community either. Like, we love to tell Muslim women how they look. I had this experience, I'm going to tell you about this experience, where someone, actually a pretty well-known sheikh, I was... I was in my travels, in one of the places in my travels, asked to see me. And so I went to see him. And one of the first things he said to me when he saw me was, uh, oh, you look tired. <laughs> I was like, okay, first of all, that's weird. Like, I'm not used to people, to men telling me how I look, but okay, I look tired. And I, I was so stunned that I didn't have a good answer. But later, I had the answer, which I'm going to, the next person from this to infinity, to infinity, who asks, who tells me I look tired, is going to hear the following sentence. Yes, why don't you look tired? That's how we should all look. We should all look tired. If you don't look tired, there's something wrong with you. Why don't you look tired? What's, what are you not doing? <laughs> what are you not doing? Here? Are you that selfish that you don't look tired? Are you really that selfish that your whole life is all about not looking tired? Mashallah. No, get up and get some work done and start looking tired. Like, for God's sakes, you should, we should all look tired. That should be the way we all look. <laughs> for crying out loud. And, and so this whole makeup industry that wants everyone to look like they're 23. I don't look 23 because I'm not 23, okay? I'm a grandmother. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. That's the best. Why don't you look tired? What is wrong with you that you don't look tired? Why are you getting so much sleep that you don't look tired? Clearly sleeping too much and probably missing prayer. Huh. <laughs> well, I mean, okay, so I'm responding to a question in the chat box now, which says, what should we do about co to cope with missing our bad deeds? I mean, for, you know, it depends on how intense that missing is, right? I mean, the, when it's an intense missing, you'll have to do things um, that are, if it's an intense missing, you'll have to have tools in place to make sure you don't fall back into those old habits, to be sure. And maybe I'm not the expert in that, like what the tools are. All of my tools would be 
get up, read Quran, um, exercise, eat. I mean, you know, the sort of things of life. Uh, go visit someone. Be around people. Definitely be around people. Like, don't be alone because being alone pushes people into bad habits. But um, I bet there are lots of great articles out there for addicts that you could read. And uh, whether you, I mean, we're all addicted to different things in different ways, right? Whether it's a, something people are typically addicted to or not. Uh, so the question wasn't he concerned about your well-being. I don't know. I didn't even know this person. Like maybe. I mean, but do, can you imagine? I look that tired that he's like, "Hey, are you gonna fall over?" <laughs> maybe. I don't know. Still, he's all. I mean, I don't know. But my point is that the culture of I need to look in a certain way is a culture that we as Muslim women we need to provide space for all women that says, look, you as a woman, your role in life is not just to stand up and be a sexual attraction to others and women alike, because that's what the world is today. Your role in life is greater than that and higher than that. And we as Muslim women are going to create space for you, where we live in this life like this. So we live in this life, putting aside the uh, trappings of dunya, and walking forward in the service of the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the following the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who would stand in prayer till his feet swelled. I mean, think about that. We're missing prayers and our prophet was standing extra prayers until his feet swelled. How long do you have to stand in prayer until your feet swell up? How long? How long do you have to stand in prayer until your feet swell up? And how much was he enjoying that prayer that he was, that he was, he didn't feel his feet, that his feet weren't bothering him. But that standing was giving him internal strength, it was filling the ocean, it was giving to the ocean. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad. Salatu salam alayhi. So when we're making Hijrah, we want to go from the place where we're struggling to practice to a place where we are practicing better, better and better, inshallah. It's good to have examples of people that you want to think about. Like, I, I remember when I was young, I, the Prophet ﷺ, there is a, a saying, I'm not sure if it's a hadith or a qawl, but it is that to have taqwa is to act in a way as you would act in front of two upstanding members of your community, okay? And so I used to, I used to walk around with, like theoretically in my head, like everywhere I went, I would think that I had two teachers that were very close to me, and wherever I went, I would take them with me theoretically, right? So I would be thinking, okay, if I, if if they were walking with me, would I be, would I would would is what I'm wearing, would they be thumbs up to what I'm wearing? The way I'm interacting with this person would be, would they be thumbs up to the way I'm interacting? Um, so you might want to take a parent and may, and take me along with you. Like, I'll go with you everywhere. I will go and see and, and we'll, uh, we'll and, and just ask yourself, okay, I'm about to miss Duhur, but I have my parent here and I have Tamra here and maybe I'd be embarrassed in front of them. So no, I'm going to pray because they remind me and, and remind me of, uh, they remind me of, how I want to be with Allah. And SubhanAllah, I talked about this in the, in the book club last week, so if you're in the book club, forgive me for the repetition. But, um, but I want to tell it anyway because I love this story. There is a, one of the students of Rumi was a Christian convert, he was Greek, and he was, his language, his first language was not the first language of the people of that space, Turkish, Persian, Arabic. His first language was Greek. And so when he would say things, as all of us who have learned a second language know, he would say things sometimes in funny ways. And there was some jealousy and issues in Rumi's time around who is Shams and who is Rumi Shams and all this. So in some sort of investigation, I guess, they asked this young convert, why, why do you love this guy so much? Like, what's your attachment to Jaladadine Rumi? And he looked for the words to say, and he said, um, he's my Lord, okay? And they jumped on him. What? 
shit. You are making him your God. You're making him your whatever. They dragged him off to the judge for punishment for blasphemy. And the judge said, this is what they said. He said, no, I'm, you know, I'm, in era, this language is not my first language. Let me try to do that again. He said something worse. Put his foot deeper in his mouth. He said, no, no, no. I love him because he makes gods. <laughs> and now people were like, you see, I told you this is all terrible. And he needs to be punished. And we should go get Rumi too. And all this. Anyway, so the judge said, wait, hang on a minute. I, please, young man, tell, this is what you said. Is this what you mean? Explain what you mean. No, no, no. That's not what I mean. Thought and thought, and he put his words together, and he said, I love Jalaluddin Rumi, so Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi, because he makes God real for me. When I'm with him, I know God is real. La ilaha illallah. And I think this is very a very beautiful way to describe the importance of having Odiya Allah on this earth because they help the communities remember that God is real. And it's also important for us to remember that wherever we are in the secular society, there's someplace more beautiful to be. Wherever we are in our Mecca of struggle, there's a Medina to be in that is, that is so beautiful that it is a city of real. And we know, any of you, anyone here who has felt love, Anyone who if you loved, if you loved a man, if you loved a child, loved a friend, loved a teacher, if you felt that human love at any time of your life, you know that it's very difficult to describe, but you know it's real. And that's what Rumi was for many people, the ability to he talks about love, he made love really made God real. And that's what we all hope to be. We want to make Hisha to that place where our lives are so beautiful that we make God real to the people around us. And that's our hijra, to really fulfill the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala salatu salam alayhi, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And let us truly follow in his footsteps. In kuntum tuhibboon Allah fattabi'uni. If you love Allah, then follow me. So that's connected there. We want the love of Allah. We have to follow in the footsteps of the Prophet. I Allah. Allah will love you. So it's a clear, clear pattern, clear way. We have to make that hijrah. Follow in the footsteps of the Prophet. Be proud of that following. Remember that you're following an ocean, and an ocean has never ending blessings to give you. And dig deep, right? Soak yourself in the ocean of Rasulullah. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu will reward you and the hijra will be a new you, a new all of us this year, where we will be people wherever we go, we, we remind others that God is real. Inshallah. Thank you for joining me this morning at for our online open halaqa. This is every month. You can invite anyone you like to this online open halaqa. I want to also remind you that late registration is still open for Riba classes, and I have not started my classes yet. So if you would like to join me in my classes, my classes will start tomorrow with fun and friendly fiqh and uh, companions and then shafi'i fiqh and then aqidah. And uh, also we have amazing other classes. We have tzizkiyah classes, classes of purification, classes of Arabic. The people who take our Arabic classes, they're always writing to us and saying, wow, like I didn't think I could learn and here I am learning. So I really want to recommend our classes. Also Quran classes, if you are, if you would like to get serious about your recitation and your memorization, join our Quran classes. Uh, the Judge House Book Club, you can see that flyer right in the middle. If you are not on Telegram, our book club is on Telegram. It's just like WhatsApp. It's an app you put on your phone. And then you can search Joy Jot's Book Club or just go to that link that's there. Joy Jot's Book Club broadcast. Once you're there, you click on discussion. And every Sunday morning at 6 or 7 in the morning, CST, we discuss the chapter that is part of Joy Jot's that week. And our Ibadah Intensive, we do still have registration open for that. It'll be October 4th to October 7th here in Minnesota. It will be just Ibadah. It'll be Ibadah retreats. So if you are in need of a restart, 
definitely join us for that here in northern Minnesota. And our Tahajjud threads I mentioned earlier. So if you are, if you would like to get yourself together in your Tahajjud threads, definitely uh, sign up for those. The link is right there in the flyer. And I have my glasses on to see that link. Oh, it disappeared. So we'll just tell you to, to we'll just have the admins put the link in the chat. Also, if you are, we our Daybreak Press Literary Conference is in November, November 9th, here in Min in Minnesota at Hamlin University. And we are so excited to have it here. We're excited to have it at the university. We're also going to be announcing and having a an award ceremony for our first ever Daybreak Book Awards. And we have winners. You've seen the winners already, but the the actual award ceremony will be during that weekend at that conference. And this is our fifth annual conference, by the way. So we're really excited about that. It's our fifth annual conference of Giving Rise to Women's Voices. So excited. Join us. Come to the conference and uh, uh, take part in the amazing talks and workshops and things that will be happening both during the conference and pre and post. I'm also very excited to announce that for the first time ever in December, no, in December, in July, July 16th in Dallas, we will be having, we will be honored to host our very first ever Ribat graduation ceremony. We will have students graduating from our level two certification program, uh, level two, which is Islamic teacher certificate. This is two levels, not two years. Many people have, been, have spent five years on this learning. And they have grown into incredible young women. We're so excited to graduate them. The tie, we are beginning to fill the world with young women religious leaders. And I hope that you'll join us in this process, both at the graduation, also signing up for classes and get your own certificate, inshallah, an Islamic teacher's certificate or religious leadership certificate or both, or both, because you can get both. And I'm so excited about this year. Whoops. Well, there you go. The Muslim Women's Literary Conference. Admins, that became very big. You want to make that smaller? <laughs> oh, I'm just going to get rid of it. There we go. Oh, what happened, guys? There we are. All right. And uh, thank you for joining me this week. And may Allah reward you. I hope to see you in the Ibadah Intensive and in my classes next week. Sign up for my classes. If you haven't, sign up. Sign up. I want to see you. I want to meet you. It's time. And of course, sign up for the other teachers' classes as well. But sign up for mine too, because I like to meet you. All right. So I come to everyone. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful week. Wonderful month, depending on when I'm going to see you next online. Assalamu alaikum.